Why is forgiving a person's sins a greater miracle than raising someone from the dead or healing them from sickness? Let me give you three reasons. Number one, it meets the greatest need. You know, your greatest need this morning is not for a new job or for a new wife or for a new husband or for new kids, or for a new home or for a new car or for a new body, which would be nice. Everybody over 70 say amen. Your greatest need is for the forgiveness of your sin. What would it do to have your body healed and to die in sin and to be separated from God for all eternity? Jesus said, if you gain the whole world but lose your soul, it profits you nothing. Amen. You know, there are three miracles recorded in Luke chapter 7. I want you to take note of the first miracle is a great miracle of the healing of the centurion's servant. The second miracle we saw was the greater miracle, the raising of the widow's son of Nain. The boy had died and Jesus stopped the procession and raised him from the dead. And this morning we have the third miracle, and I'm calling it the greatest miracle of all, the forgiving and the restoring of a sinful woman. Now you'd say, Pastor John, why is forgiving a person's sins a greater miracle than raising someone from the dead or healing them from sickness? Let me give you three reasons. Number one, it meets the greatest need. You know, your greatest need this morning is not for a new job or for a new wife or for a new husband or for new kids or for a new home or for a new car or for a new body which would be nice. Everybody over 70 say amen. <laughs> your greatest need is for the forgiveness of your sins. What would it do to have your body healed and to die in sin and to be separated from God for all eternity? Jesus said, if you gain the whole world but lose your soul, it profits you nothing. Amen? So the greatest blessing and greatest miracle that God could ever perform is the forgiving of our sins and the restoration of our lives. And then secondly, it produces the greatest results, the greatest results, transform lives for the glory of God. Our lives are changed by the forgiveness that we experience. And then thirdly, it requires the greatest price. And I'll talk more about that in a moment, but God had to send his son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay for our sins that we might be forgiven. It costs God the life of his own dear son. But the idea that God can and will forgive us freely of our sins is surely the greatest news that ever made known to man. Yet sadly, many are ignorant of this truth or they consider it irrelevant. You may be here even right now and you've already said, well, this sermon's not for me. I'm not a sinner. The Bible says we've all sinned, amen? The Bible says if we say we've not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So the question is, how can I be forgiven of my sins? How can I be assured of eternal life and know that when I die, I'll go to heaven to be with the Lord? That's so important. So our text today, we're gonna learn some important facts about forgiveness in this beautiful passage has three movements. We'll look at one at a time. First, there's the party, then there's the parable, and then we'll look at the point. The party, the parable, and the point. Let's look at, first of all, the party, verse 36 to 39. We've got a lot of verses to read, so follow me closely in your Bible. Verse 36 to verse 39, there's a party. One of the Pharisees, verse 36, desired him, that is Jesus, that he would eat with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. Now, if that were me, I wouldn't go to the Pharisee's house because I know he's going to try to trap me or get me in some, some kind of situation and that it would, he would be antagonistic. But Jesus agreed to go to his house for dinner. And behold, verse 37, here we have the party crasher. A woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat or dinner in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster box of ointment. Literally, this is a jar, a stone alabaster jar 
of precious spikenard or ointment or frankincense. She stood at his feet, verse 38, behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears and to wipe them with the hairs of her head. She kissed his feet repeatedly and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, referring to Jesus, now he's not saying it audibly, just thinking it, this man, if he were a prophet, and he concludes he was not, would have known who and what manner of woman this is which touches him, for she is a sinner. So he's thinking, he doesn't, not, he's not really a prophet. If he were a prophet, he wouldn't let this woman touch him. Now, I need to set the stage for this party that's going on. It was thrown by the Pharisee in verse 36. Now, a Pharisee was a sect of the Jews. It was a sect of the Jews that were very strict religious observance. The word Pharisee means separated ones or separate ones. So during the intertestament period of time, they came into existence where they devoted themselves to nothing but keeping every jot and tittle of the law. And they became synonymous with hypocrisy. Now, I'm sure not all of them were hypocrites, but because they were legalists, they became self-righteous. They looked down their nose at everybody else. No one's as good as us or as holy as us or as religious as us or as separate as us. And so they were just common hypocrites, and they were antagonistic toward Jesus. Every one of the Pharisees mentioned in the Gospel of Luke was antagonistic toward Jesus. So why he invited them to dinner, we don't know. Where they were at dinner, we don't know. Some say Capernaum, early on in the ministry of Jesus, yet still in the Galilee region. But he was probably being antagonistic, wanted to trap Jesus or do something to get him. So he... He invites him over for this meal, this religious man. Now, his name is mentioned in verse 40, and we'll get there in just a moment. His name was Simon. Simon. Simon the Pharisee. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this story we're reading, and I'm going to try to clarify this. This story in Luke is only in Luke. So it's not the same story as that of Matthew 26, Mark 14, or John 12. Now, that may be some, you might be saying, I don't even have any clue what you're talking about. In those places of the other Gospels, there's a story that takes place just before Christ is crucified. And it takes place in Bethany, not here in Galilee, which Bethany is by Jerusalem. And this other story in John 12 is clearly a reference to Martha, who was the sister of Lazarus, and the friend of Jesus in her home, where she anointed the head of Jesus and his feet with ointment. And then the the, uh, man Judas said, well, for what was this waste? This could have been sold and the money could have been given to the poor. And Jesus said, leave her alone. What she's done, she's done for my burial and it will be a memorial for her. So it's not the same story. So don't get the two confused, nor another mistake people make is this sinful woman in the story, which, by the way, was a prostitute or a harlot until she met Jesus, is actually not a reference to Mary Magdalene. There's no reference in the Bible that Mary Magdalene was a sexually immoral woman. But this woman is called a woman of the city who was a sinner, which is implied clearly that she was a harlot or what we would call a prostitute. So the Pharisee throws a party and a prostitute crashes it. You couldn't get two more unlikely people. A Pharisee and a prostitute, he's freaking out. Now, how is it that she can come to a dinner party when she's not invited? Obviously, she wasn't invited. Here's the deal. In that culture, whenever they would have rabbis for dinner, They would have it in their wealthy homes. They would have it in an outdoor patio, and they would provide cushions or pads around the dinner table for people in the town to come to sit around the perimeter and to listen to the conversation. They actually did that. So an uninvited guest could come. Now, I'd like to have a dinner party with all these freaky people hanging around your table listening to your conversation. That was the picture. Now, you also have to picture this. The table they're eating at 
was probably only inches off the ground. So they didn't sit in chairs like we do and pull their legs up under the table. The woman didn't have to crawl under the table to weep on Jesus' feet. They had around the table. Now, the table would be in a, in a, in a shape of a horseshoe or C-shape, and the outer round band of the table would have a bed all the way around the C-shaped table, and the guests would lay on their left side on the dinner bed with the table at their head. They would reach their right hands over, eating with their hands. They would grab their food. They would roll back and drop it in. I think this is awesome. <laughs> I think we should revive the dinner bed, amen? We should revive this. When you eat, you don't have to go to bed, you're already there. <laughs> when you wake up, you're already eating, you grab some more, you drop it in, you go back to sleep, you roll over. So she, they're laying on their left side, eating with their right hand, and his feet are extended outside of the dead bed. So she could approach from the outside, and Christ's feet would be right there, she knelt down. She most likely came with an intention to take the alabaster jar, break it, which was very costly perfume, pour it on his feet. But when she got to his feet, she began to sob and to weep with gratitude. Her tears are tears of gratitude for being forgiven. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want you to understand, this woman is doing what she's doing because she has already been forgiven. She is not doing it to be forgiven. She's doing it because she has been forgiven. So when we are forgiven, it leads to gratitude. Gratitude leads to love, and love leads to worship of Jesus Christ and service to others. So she was coming with a grateful heart, a gratitude for being forgiven. She began to weep over his feet, which were extended outside the bed, and her tears were washing his feet. Now, when it says, wash his feet with her tears, in verse 38, every time they're mentioned in the story, it's repeatedly, she continually cried. She was weeping and sobbing, washing his feet, and then she took down her hair, which no dignified one would ever do in public. She took her hair down. She began to dry his feet with her hair, and then she took the alabaster jar, maybe around the necklace, broke off the top, and poured this very expensive ointment on his feet. So she's kissing his feet repeatedly. Now in the Orient, no one would touch another person's feet unless you were the lowest slave. So this is very humbling. She's kissing his feet. A little footnote, too, I discovered, is there's only two places in the Bible where it's mentioned anyone ever kissed Jesus. This one, first time, was a prostitute. Kissed his feet out of gratitude for forgiveness. The second one was who? Judas Iscariot. Betrayed him with a kiss. Interesting, the only two times Jesus is mentioned as being kissed in the Bible. So this moving picture, this moving story, behold, a woman in the city was a sinner. She was a harlot. She came and poured her ointment on Jesus, weeping, washing his feet with her tears, wiping them with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed his feet. Then notice verse 39. When the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. Now notice that. He isn't speaking out loud or audibly. He's just thinking this in his own heart and mind. And he said, this man, and that's, that's a, a, a form of being, a, that's a derogatory kind of negative statement. This man if he were a prophet, and the inference is he's not, he would have known who and what manner this was of woman that touches him. For she's a, she's a wicked woman. She's a sinner. Now, Jesus knew quite well who she was. And I believe that she had encountered Christ before this story. And she had already been forgiven. So she's using this as an opportunity to show her gratitude and her love. There's all kinds of beautiful lessons about worship here. Worship is the outgrowth of our gratitude of being forgiven and our desire to worship God and glorify Him 
for the blessing of forgiving our sins. So this guy was appalled that Jesus was letting her touch him. So several things. The fact that Jesus would go to dinner with this Pharisee is amazing. And I think it's interesting, you've heard me mention it before, that Jesus never turned down the dinner invitation. Neither do I. It's biblical. You want to come eat? Yes, I'll be there. He even invited himself over for dinner in Revelation. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, open the door. I'll come in and eat with you. He invites himself over. Try it in the foyer after church. <laughs> Invite yourself over for dinner. So this is the scene in the party. It's been crashed by this harlot and the Pharisee is appalled, and he concludes Jesus is not really a prophet. He would not let this woman touch her. Now, earlier in our story, we learned that Jesus is the friend of sinners and publicans and prostitutes. You know, that's one of the central themes of Luke's gospel, that Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And it's also the gospel of women, by the way, too. So there are more stories of Christ and women than in any other of the Gospels put together. Now we move from the party, verse 36 to 39, to the parable that grew out of this episode at the Pharisee's house. So Jesus answered and said unto Simon. So Simon's freaking out. This guy's not really a prophet. He wouldn't let this woman touch him. He said, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee, verse 40. And he said, Master, say on. Now, no doubt, reluctantly. Okay, whatever you want to say, go ahead. He said, there was a certain creditor. So the parable starts in verse 41. And the parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. There was a certain creditor or money lender, which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence. The word is denarii, which was the common salary for a day laborer. So 500 days labor, and one owed 50 pence, 50 days of labor. Now, when they had nothing to pay, now I'm going to come back to these verses, but notice that. Nothing to pay. Neither one would, could pay. They were both insolvent. He freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them, he says to Simon, will love the most. Now, reluctantly, Simon answered and said, I suppose he that had, which hath forgiven mo, been forgiven most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Now, Jesus gave this parable to describe the contrast between Simon and the sinful woman. So he said, there's two people that owed a debt. One owed 500 pence, which is a denarii, a day's wage, and the other owed 50. Now, the amount wasn't the issue. The amount indicated whether or not we were aware of or sensed our need for forgiveness, the greatest amount of need for forgiveness. Both were debtors, both owed, both were insolvent, both had no ability to pay. So he freely forgave them both. Which of them would love the most, which was aimed at Simon, this is why this woman has showered this love upon me. She has anointed my feet, kissed them with her lips, and put the oil on them. So Simon said, well, I suppose to he that has forgiven the most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. So the point is, to whom much is forgiven, loveth much. You know, when you see somebody that's really grateful and thankful for their forgiveness, they do that by worshiping God and serving God. When you see someone that's not grateful or thankful, they're not aware of their debt. They're not aware of their sin. They're not aware of their need. They're not aware or conscious of their sinful state or that they've been forgiven. There's no gratitude toward God. It's almost like, you know, God's lucky to have me because I'm so amazing. Not so. We're going to learn some important lessons from this. Now, from the parable, we get the point in verse 44 to 50. So he turned to the woman. Here's the application. And he said unto Simon, now I want you to notice how this sets up. He turns to the woman. Jesus looks at the woman directly. 
She's down at his feet weeping, kissing them, anointing them. And he said then to Simon, so he looks at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. Seest thou this woman? And the point is, you don't really see her or know her. I entered into your house, speaking to Simon, you gave me no water for my feet, which was customary. But she washed my feet with her tears, and she's wiped them continually with her hairs of her head. You, Simon, verse 45, you gave me no kiss, which was customary as a greeting. But this woman, since the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. And my head, verse 46, with oil, you did not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Here's the application. Therefore, I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. I love these verses. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So he said unto her, verse 48, thy sins are forgiven. So up to this point, he's looking at the woman speaking to Simon. Now he's looking at the woman and speaking to her. Your sins are forgiven. And they that sat at the dinner with him began to say within themselves, this is the company at the party, who is this that forgives sins also? And he said to the woman, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. So they said, who does he think he is? Simon said he's not a prophet or he wouldn't let this woman touch him. He's going to get cooties, become unclean, which is, by the way, what Pharisees did. They wouldn't let anyone touch them because they'd become unclean. And then who does he think he is that he can forgive sins? Jesus could read their thoughts. Jesus could forgive their sins. He is God. He knows our hearts. He can forgive our sins. That's only a, a prerogative of God. Now, here we have the point or the application. It's such a beautiful story. Now, I'm going to give you five important facts we learn about forgiveness, and they'll appear on the screen, but I want you to see them in your text. If you're taking notes, write them down. Number one, fact number one, we all need forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. Can I get an amen? Yeah. We all need to be forgiven. Simon the Pharisee, and the sinful prostitute had something in common. Now, Simon didn't think so, and you may not think so, but we all have something in common. All have sin, the Bible says. All have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's no one righteous, no, not one. You know, we all have a common debt. Write that down. We all have a common debt. Look at verse 41 in our story. In verse 41, it says, the creditor had two debtors, two debtors. The point is, they both had debt. Granted, one was a greater debt than the other, but we all have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So we are all sinners. Simon, the Pharisee, and the sinful prostitute, both sinners. Now remember, there are different kinds of sins. There's action sins and attitude sins. This is important for you to understand. There's action sins and attitude sins. Action sins are sins of the flesh. They're open sins. They're understood by others. Sins of the spirit are attitude sins. They're hidden. Only God can see and know them. Remember the story of the prodigal son and had, who had an older brother, will be getting there in several months in Luke chapter 15. The younger son took his father's inheritance and did what? Wasted it on riotous living. That's where we get our word prodigal, riotous living. He partied hardy. He just went crazy partying. And he came to himself, repented, went back to the father and was forgiven. Father threw a party. And when the party was going on, his older brother, who had been faithfully serving there, the father for all these years, heard the celebration, went back to find out what's going on. 
He found out from a servant that his younger brother had repented, came home, and his father had killed a fatted calf and was having a big celebration. What did he do? He sulked. He griped and complained. He said, I've been serving my father faithfully all these years, and never once has he given me a party with my friends. He's never killed a fatted calf for me. He's never done this for me. And he sat outside pouting, was all angry and upset. He was guilty of sins of the Spirit. Attitude sins. Action sins, the prodigal. Attitude sins, the older brother. Guess what? They are both sinners before God. You might be here this morning and feel very dignified, very good, very self-righteous, but God sees your heart. You know, the Bible says that pride is a sin. The proud God knows far off. The proud look God hates. The independent spirit. So don't think that you're not a sinner because you haven't wasted it on prostitutes and riotous living. They're sins of the spirit as well as sins of the flesh. Jesus knows the actions of the sins of the woman, just as he knows the attitude of the sins of Simon the Pharisee. Remember also there are sins of omission as well as sins of commission. What do I mean by that? Did you know you can sin by not doing something? For him to know is to do good and does it not to him it is sin. When you know to do good and you do it not, you sin by omitting something. You can sin by doing nothing. You don't have to do something to sin. You can just not do what God wants you to do, and you've sinned by omission. So important. Remember when Jesus said, I came to your house, Simon, go back with me to verse 44 and 46. You gave me no water for my feet. When you entered a home, the customary thing was that you would wash someone's feet. He didn't do that. He says, she's washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with the hairs of her head. Verse 45, you gave me no kiss. This woman, since the time I came in, have not stopped repeatedly to kiss my feet. You didn't even shake my hand. You didn't even greet me with a kiss. My head, verse 46, thou didst not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. These are all sins of omission. You didn't do what you're supposed to do. Didn't even show them the common courtesies. So... Very important. Now, write down Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, no, not one. Notice they also had this in common. They had a common insolvency. Look at verse 42. It says that when they had nothing to pay, neither one of them had anything to pay. Both Simon and the sinful woman had nothing to pay, and we all who have sinned have nothing by which we can commend ourselves to God. We sing, could my tears forever flow? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. You can cry, you can weep, you can anoint Jesus' feet with oil, you can do service to others, but they can never atone for your sins. You have nothing by which you can commend yourself to God. We need to all see that we're sinners. We need to all see that we're bankrupt spiritually, and there's nothing that I can do to commend myself to God to earn, deserve, or merit forgiveness. Well, what about if I get baptized? Go ahead. Baptism is only an outward showing of an inward work. If you haven't been forgiven, all you're going to be is wet. You're still a sinner. I've had people say, hold me down a long time. I got a lot to bear. Okay, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Water can't wash away your sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, amen? So religious deeds, confirmation, catechism, baptism, 
good works, good deeds, service to others, none of that can wash away my sins. Only Jesus can do that by His precious blood He shed on the cross. What's important is having a sense of sin. Contrast the Pharisee and the prostitute. The Pharisee didn't realize he was a sinner. He had no awareness. The prostitute had a great awareness of her sin and experienced forgiveness. But then write down number two. Here's the second fact. Forgiveness is the gracious gift of God. Now, this is basic, but super important. First of all, we all need forgiveness. Secondly, forgiveness is the gracious gift of God. Look at verse 42. In verse 42, it says that the creditor freely forgave them both. That word freely, in my King James Bible, frankly, means without a cause. So we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should both, says Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Write down Romans chapter 3, verse 24. It says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we are freely forgiven. Now, though forgiveness is free, it's not cheap. Forgiveness is free, but it's not cheap. It cost God the Father the life of the Son of God. It cost Jesus being crucified on a cross. It's very expensive. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, says that through the death of the cross, that He is the propitiation for our sins. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Write down number three. Fact number three, forgiveness is received by faith. We all need forgiveness. Forgiveness is by grace through faith. Look at verse 50. I love that. He said to the woman, thy what? Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Not your acts of kindness, Not your love, not your tears, not your kisses, your faith. We're not saved by loving God. We love God because He saved us. He loved us first. We respond in love. So her tears and her kisses and anointing His feet and wiping them with her hair were all the fruit of forgiveness, not the root. Some people misinterpret this story. And they believe that Jesus is teaching here that she's forgiven because she loves much. She's forgiven because of what she did. No, 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 no. What she did was because she was forgiven. Forgiveness brings love. Love brings worship and devotion. So her love was the fruit of having been forgiven, and she was painfully aware of the enormity of her sin. Write down John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever what? Believes. That's faith. I know you know the verse well. I quote it all the time. We all know the verse. But it's so deeply profound. God so loved the world, which means the world, everybody, that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, unique Son, that whoever, whoever means whoever, believes, there's the word, It means that trust in, relies on, or clings to, or puts their faith in. The Bible is absolutely clear. All have sinned, salvation's by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, no one else. This is the clear teaching of Scripture. How are we saved? By faith. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is not just an emotion. Faith is not just feeling something is true. Faith is putting your trust in its object, Jesus Christ. Jesus (coughs) is the object of our faith. Your faith is not in your church affiliation. You die and go to heaven and say, I went to Revival Christian Fellowship. You better let me in. 
I endured those John Miller sermons for many years. Anybody that can endure that should get to go to heaven. Or I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Methodist, or I'm a Episcopalian, or I'm a, I'm a Presbyterian, whatever it might be. Or I've done this, I've done that. Your faith is in Jesus Christ. If God were to ask you why should he let you in heaven, your answer should be because your son Jesus died for me and I've trusted in him. I've taken his hand. And his righteousness has been imputed to me by faith. I stand in him forgiven and righteous. That's the basis. So faith in Christ alone. So grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Amen? That's how we are saved. Write down Ephesians 2, verse 8 again. It says, by grace you're saved, and here's our phrase, through faith. And that not of yourself. That is, salvation is not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Romans 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me give you number four. Write it down. Forgiveness is certain. I love this. Forgiveness is certain. Look at verse 47. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Now Simon is looking or Jesus is looking at the woman, but talking to Simon. And he says about the woman, her sins are forgiven. Now, there's something you need to understand, that when he mentions her sins are forgiven in verse 47, and then again, look at verse 48, he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven, that the grammar and the tense of the statement of the verb forgiven means past tense, present experience, future reality. Past, present, and future. Her sins have been, are, and will always stand forgiven. That's what the text is saying. This is a marvelous statement. I love this. Her sins, which are many, many of us could say the same thing, are forgiven. That's a hallelujah, praise the Lord shouting verse. Amen? Your sins, my sins, to the blood of Jesus Christ, have been forgiven, if you trust Christ. And they always stand forgiven. And then he turns to her in verse 48 and says, thy sins are forgiven. Not maybe, not lucky, not hopefully, not if you're lucky, they are forgiven. I believe that the Bible teaches that we can be assured of forgiveness and salvation. Did you right now know that you can be sure you're forgiven and you're going to heaven? You can have assurance. Let me give you three ways to know. Number one, it's based on God the Father's word. It's based on God the Son's work. It's based on God the Holy Spirit's witness. So the word of God the Father, the work of God the Son who died on the cross, and the inner witness of God the Holy Spirit that we are his children. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So if you don't have assurance this morning, if you don't know beyond any doubt that if you were to die, you'd go to heaven, that you're forgiven, it's your greatest need. It's your greatest need. Don't leave church today without trusting Christ. Here's number five, and my last fact about forgiveness. Forgiveness results in a changed life. Re forgiveness results in a changed life. Verse 47, she had a new love. She has been forgiven much. She loves much. Verse 47, was seen in her act of selfless, humble, abandoned worship. Martin Luther said her tears were heart water. I love that. Her tears were heart water. We also know she had a new peace. Look at verse 50 once again. He said to the woman, go in peace. Not only your faith saved you, but now you can go in peace. Literally in the Greek, that would read, go into peace. You know that when our sins are forgiven, we have peace with God? 
And then when we walk with the Lord, we have the peace of God in our hearts. One of the reasons why you're in turmoil right now is because there's no peace between you and God. Your sins have separated you from God. You need to be forgiven of your sins. When you are forgiven, you have a transformed life, a new love, a new peace. Go into peace. And thirdly and lastly, she had a new freedom. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest for your souls. You know, the Bible says there's no rest for the wicked. They're like the troubled sea. There's no peace until you're forgiven and the guilt is lifted and your, your heart is clean. There's no greater need, there's no greater joy than knowing that my sins have been forgiven. So, God's grace forgave and transformed this sinful prostitute. Her faith had secured pardon. Her pardon had awakened gratitude. Her gratitude was expressed by her deeds of devoted love. But Simon, poor Simon, self-righteous, proud, did not know who Jesus was, rejected Christ, rejected this dear woman, and rejected his only hope of salvation. You know, you might be here this morning and you have no assurance of forgiveness. I'm here to tell you that before you leave for church today, you can be forgiven of all your sins. It is your greatest need. If you've never repented, if you've never believed in Jesus, if you've never trusted him as your savior, it is your greatest need. You die in your unforgiven state, you'll be separated from God for all eternity. But if you trust Christ today and you believe in Jesus Christ and receive him as your savior, your sins can all be forgiven. You can have peace with God, you can have the peace of God, and you can have assurance that when you die, you'll spend eternity in heaven. Amen? If God has spoken to you through this message today and you're not sure that you're a child of God, maybe you don't know for sure that if you died today that you would go to heaven, you've never really trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would like to lead you in a prayer right now, inviting Christ to come into your heart and to be your savior. So as I pray this prayer, I want you to repeat it out loud, right where you are, after me. Make it from your heart, inviting Christ to come in and be your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I pray that you'll forgive me and come into my heart and make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe in you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God heard that prayer, and I believe that God will and does forgive your sins. We'd like to help you get started growing in your walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you. If you just prayed with Pastor John to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are so excited for you. And we'd like to send you a Bible and some resources to get you started in your relationship with the Lord. Simply click on the contact link at the top of the page and tell us something like, I prayed to accept Christ. We'll get your Bible and resources mailed out to you right away. God bless you and welcome to the family of God.